I made a custom level editor for my indie game and it went not so good at first, but I think I did end up with something pretty cool. But for context, I'm Kenneth and I'm working on Isadora's Edge, a 2D action platformer, very Hollow Knight inspired with great pixel art. Uh, if you want to support the development of the game, I just opened a Patreon, links below. Uh, also, it's available for wishlisting on Steam. And for the past several months, I've been working on designing levels for the game. Let me show you how I've been approaching building out levels. I essentially break the level into a bunch of rooms and assign each room a number of parameters. First, it gets assigned a mechanic or a number of combined mechanics. For example, I've been testing out this mechanic that I'm calling an auto lifter. Uh, every couple of seconds, it launches into the air and then falls back down. Uh, because this is a mechanic for the mushroom forest, I'm thinking it would be a little bed of mushrooms that builds up with gas or spores and something until it pops and launches up into the air before it like falls down and then fills up with gas again. At least that's what I'm imagining it as because currently it's just the Godot icon, but wide. So that's the first parameter of a room. Now let's say I assign the auto lifter to a bunch of rooms because I want to explore the mechanic and see if it's actually fun. Well, after the mechanic, I assign rooms a challenge type. The main two I'm using right now are platforming and combat. And this is pretty straightforward. Do I want to use the auto lifters to create some fun platforming sections? Or do I want to use them in a way that makes a combat scenario more interesting? Then once I've assigned a challenge type, I assign a challenge difficulty. This is a rating from zero to five, where five is the hardest challenge available and zero is a tutorial. And I don't mean a tutorial where Chim pops up like, hey, Isadora, Isadora, you gotta stand on a mushroom so they can bust you up into the air. To bust you up into the air? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Not that kind of thing. I mean that it's a tutorial in that the mechanic is introduced with little to no real danger, usually in two stages. First, with no danger at all, and then second, with the appearance of danger. But let me show you what I mean by that. This is an auto lifter room, platforming challenge, difficulty zero, so a tutorial. And as you can see, Isadora is introduced to the auto lifter mechanic here in a no danger situation. You see it shoot up into the air and then fall down. And then you get to ride it up to the next level where you see another auto lifter. Now this auto lifter has spikes on both sides, but they aren't really a threat because if you're just standing on the lifter, there's literally no chance of getting hit by the spikes. However, the spikes do prevent you from being able to wall climb to the top. This means you have to use the momentum gained from jumping off the platform at the right time to make it to the next part of the level. This means that even though it ends up only being like 20 to 30 seconds of gameplay, it teaches the player almost everything they need to know about the mechanic. So once they start facing the harder versions of this mechanic down the line in later rooms, it feels completely fair because they already know how it works. And for an example of one of those harder challenges, here's an auto lifter platforming challenge with difficulty level four. I, I held up three. <laughs> Platforming challenge with difficulty level four. I almost held up three again with difficulty level four. <laughs> Timing the jumps and dashes between the spikes here is actually pretty difficult uh, because the extra momentum is working against you, flinging you into the spikes instead of like threading the needle between them. And I said spikes, but this is a forest level. So there would probably end up being some big vines with thorns or something like that. The section ends with this really precisely timed jump where the resting state of the lifter is underneath the spikes. So you have to time your jump to use the lifter as a platform while it's floating in the air over the spikes. It's actually very precise, but it feels so good when you nail it, which is why it's of difficulty four. And now I want to show you an example of one of the combat rooms. But before I can do that, I need to take a second to thank the sponsor of this video, JetBrains. Now look, if you're familiar with my channel, you already know that I love Ryder. And you've already heard me explain how my colleagues at every single game studio I've worked at in the industry all heavily recommend Ryder. But what extremely common mistake I see beginner game devs make when using Godot is not using an external editor. And when it comes to IDEs for game development, Ryder is the absolute go. Okay, their autocomplete, deep code analysis, refactoring tools, and built-in debugger all just work with Godot and improve your workflow tremendously. When I accidentally open a script in Godot's built-in editor, it straight up feels like I'm missing a limb. It makes development so much harder. And it can feel daunting at first to switch to an external editor rather than working directly in Godot's, but I am unironically at least twice as fast with development when I'm using Rider. It's a night and day difference. I cannot recommend it enough. And Rider is free for non-commercial use including all kinds of learning, self-education, and content creation. There's never been a better time to be a new game dev because you get to use Rider to learn. And as a lot of you know, I'm hosting a game jam and the lovely people over at JetBrains have agreed to add three of their all product pack commercial licenses as additional prizes for three of the winners. I specifically contacted them to ask if they would give a commercial license for Rider to the winners because I think it's just such an incredible IDE. I think if you want to truly unlock the full potential of Godot or Unity or Unreal for that matter, you should be using Rider. So thank you to JetBrains for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to the room design. 
All right, here's an example of an auto lifter combat challenge room with difficulty level three. <laughs> Actually, three this time. <laughs> there are two lifters in here and two enemies, a corrupted Ushroot and a Root Rat. Corrupted Ushroot are a more dangerous enemy because they're fast and they can send themselves flying. And the auto lifter gives them the ability to move around the room in a more interesting way. And then the Root Rat here are interesting because they're an enemy that rolls around on the ground. So I thought letting them use the auto lifters to change their elevation would be much more interesting than them being stuck on like a single flat plane and rolling back and forth. It just makes the combat more interesting because they have more options. And this combination of these two enemies on these two lifters is a nice medium difficulty, right at a three. It's not that tough, but it is trickier than just like a single corrupted Ushru running around on a flat plane. And now when I say that I've been working on level design for a couple months, what I mean is that I've been making a ton of these rooms, covering a bunch of different mechanics, combining different sets of enemies together, uh, refining enemy behavior to work well with different mechanics. Like making the corrupted Ushru work properly with the lifters took a couple hours. And then I spend a lot of time playtesting all this stuff, figuring out which rooms are actually fun and which ones are stinky, stinky hot garbage. But one thing that you probably noticed about all these test rooms is that they look like straight up cheeks. <laughs> They're just blue squares and a gray background. All of the mechanics are made out of seriously abusing the Godot icon. It's obviously all a bunch of really rough placeholder art focused exclusively on testing the actual gameplay mechanics. But behind the scenes, we have been working on level art. Malif joined the team as an environment artist right around the beginning of this year, and he's been grinding away at making stuff. For example, you can see this incredible mock-up screen of one of the early areas in the Corrupted Forest, and <laughs> I think it looks really, really good. It took quite a bit of iteration to get to this point though, so let me show you our process. First, we start with this concept piece. It's super rough, it's just basic shapes and colors, but it's giving us a good feeling of what the forest would be like if we were to flesh this out. And we liked this concept, so we did some color testing with it. You can see there are eight different versions of the concept piece here, and now Malif is insanely skilled, so all of the colors look good. But we decided on number three, because Insanity went first that it looked best, and I trust their color judgment. And also, this area of the forest isn't supposed to be too corrupted yet. And this piece also has a really good contrast to it. So overall, it just worked the best for what we wanted. And then, once we had a color scheme worked out, Malif did a polish round on the tile set. And once we had a polished tile set, we did some rough blockouts on some assets and then more rounds of polish and blockouts until we get to this awesome test screen that you've already seen. And then I plugged all of these assets into the actual game to test it out. And here you can see what the environment looks like in action. Now that you're up to date on the status of building out the levels, I can fully show you the problem I'm having. And to summarize, look at the absolute state of my project, dog. <laughs> What is going on in my editor? I mean, first, let's look at the parallaxing background because it's this weird multicolored rectangle. And this isn't a joke or an exaggeration or anything. This is what the background layers look like in game. They parallax totally normally and they look great. And in editor, they are a useless rectangle. Do you know how hard it is to make subtle artistic changes in the background layers when they look like this? Uh, for example, if I think the back layer of bushes are a little too high while I'm playing, I have to search for the correct bush layer in the scene tree since I can't click on it in editor because of, you know, the rectangle. Then I make an exclusively vibes-based change to the settings of the layer. Like, hmm, the position offset is 30. You know what? I'm feeling 24 right now. Let's send it, baby. And then I have to run the project, wait for it to launch, then load into the level just to see what that vibes-based change even looks like. And that's not even mentioning how impossible it would be to have single-use assets in the background. I mean, check out this concept art. You can see a cute little mushroom house in the background. The idea here would be to make a handful of these house assets to spread around in the background layers for any of the more villagey areas of the forest. But if I wanted to do that with the current system, not only can I not see anything, but even trying to add it to the parallax layer doesn't really work correctly with how the viewports are set up for the background layers. And setting up a brand new parallax layer for every background asset would be a nightmare, especially with how hard it is to make any changes to the parallaxing layers. And the useless rectangle is hidden behind these tile sets. So even if there was any value whatsoever in being able to see the rectangle, which there isn't, then I would have to manually hide all of the art in the level to make changes to the background and then unhide it once I want to play. And now that I've mentioned the tile sets, you might have noticed when I was just revealing them that the ground is actually broken up into multiple tile sets. And that's because of the way that my camera rendering system works. It breaks everything out into several viewport layers. And one of those layers is specifically for Isadora. So if the tile sets were always on the same viewport layer, then she would always be behind the tile sets, which is obviously wrong. Or if they were always behind her, then she would always walk in front of it, which means that her feet would cross in front of the little tufts of grass. This is also obviously wrong. So what we have to do is split the tile sets up. They have to have one in the background with the parts that she passes in front of, and one in the foreground with the stuff that she passes behind of. And in editor, I can add a special rendering tag that my camera system understands to tell it what layer it needs to render to. This works, but it can be a little annoying to deal with because every single sprite and tile set needs to be tagged correctly. And the results of these tags don't actually show up in the editor right now. So we're still decorating based on vibes. If it was just me, I could probably continue dealing with my tagging system because I'm just so used to it at this point. But like I mentioned, Malif has joined the team and it would be really convenient if Malif was able to decorate the levels directly rather than sending me the assets to plug in. First off, 
because he's much better at it than me. <laughs> so the levels will end up much nicer if he can help out with decorating. And second, the more important part, is that it will let him test his assets in game right away. He doesn't need to get all the way to a polished final asset before seeing what it looks like in game. He can just plug in the rough concept art to see how it feels while he's working on it. But the problem is that Malif doesn't know how to use Godot. He's only used Unity and Unreal before. And I cannot send this project, this wow. rectangle, <laughs> to someone who has never used Godot before and expect them to have any clue what's going on. So that's when I realized I need to make a level editor. And like I said in the frame data video, the first step in solving a problem is defining the problem. So let's be a good gameplay engineer and list our requirements. And I think we have four main issues to solve. Number one, the rectangle. We need to be able to see and edit the parallaxing background layers in real time. And we need to be able to make those changes easily. We cannot keep dealing with this rectangle. Number two, the rooms. We need the level editor to load in the room data from the test levels that I've set up so that we can easily decorate the level itself. We don't want to be converting some like test decoration levels to the actual gameplay. We want to decorate on top of the gameplay. And we need to save all this decoration data back to the room data in the actual gameplay. It can't be an annoying manual process to copy stuff over. Number three, the render tags. First, First, the state of the level in the editor needs to accurately reflect what it'll look like in game. So when we change the Z index or sort nodes around the player using the scene tree, we need to handle the render tags to make that happen in the actual game under the hood. So that the person doing the decorating using the level editor never even has to think about the render tags. And number four, the really unfortunate circumstances of not being able to use Godot. Normally, the way I'd approach all of these issues is by creating a bunch of really convenient editor tools to do stuff for me. But the current state of the project is really hard to understand, especially for someone who hasn't used Godot before. I I have a bunch of systems, a ton of assets, a bunch of scenes, all kind of edge case stuff that would make decorating directly in the project a total nightmare to navigate. The level editor needs to exist outside of my Isadora's Edge project just to shield Malif from all of the complexity of my project. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think complexity is the word I want to use there. So with those four requirements in mind, I made a big mistake. I thought because I couldn't make this tool run in editor, I needed to make a level builder that worked at runtime, essentially creating a tool that would sort of look like Mario Maker, but for decorating the existing level rather than customizing the gameplay. Malif would be able to load into the level in editing mode rather than in play mode, and then set up the assets however he wanted to and save it directly to the level. And this basically has infinite flexibility because I'm the one implementing the entire level builder. I can make it do whatever I want. So one Saturday, I decided it was finally time to start on the level builder and I locked in and I spent 10 or 11 hours just grinding it out and I got this. It sucks. <laughs> I mean, it's really bad. I mean, it's not even close to done. I've already spent a huge chunk of time on it and it's not even like 5% of the way there. I started a layer management system, a way to handle all the different asset types. And it was as I was trying to set up the level loading and saving features when I realized this is gonna be so much work. Like I already knew that making a level editor from scratch was gonna be difficult and time consuming. But as I started working on it, I realized that this was gonna eat up months of development time. And for what? I'm reinventing a bunch of systems that are already really good. Like why in the world am I writing a custom tile map system. Godot already has a tile map system and it's really good. <laughs> and building an asset management system, Godot also already has that. And that's when I realized that I actually had misunderstood requirement number four. It's not that Malif can't work in Godot, it's that Malif can't work in the original Isadora's Edge project. Yeah, there's a bunch of weird rendering rules, complex systems, and stuff you have to set up to get the levels working properly, but we don't actually need any of that stuff to decorate the levels. Instead, I can create a second, stupider project that only has the stuff needed for decorating the levels. This means I can create all those nice editor tools I wanted, while also taking advantage of all of Godot's built-in features so that I don't have to remake all that stuff myself. Then I just have to make an import and export system so that the two projects can send levels back and forth. So I started a new project called Isadora's Editor. And the very first thing I wanted to solve was editing the parallaxing backgrounds. This is the biggest and main issue with the current system for decorating the levels. So if I can solve this in this new project, I know that it's basically good to go. And here is my new level editor. You can see it looks like a random section of the level, but if I click to move around in the editor, it parallaxes. And I can freely edit the sprites in the background layer. If I duplicate one of these mushrooms and move it to a new spot, it'll just parallax in the background with the rest of that background layer. I can add as many parallaxing layers as I want by just clicking the add new parallax button that I put into a plugin for this project. You'll also see that there's a show Isadora view button. This enables the Isadora view, which puts her in the center of the editor and shows what the camera view around her would see. This is really useful because it lets you perfectly line up the assets in the camera based on where Isadora would be standing. It shows you what the camera in the game would show. The reason this is so useful is because the math for parallaxing in editor is a little weird. You have to base the parallaxing on the position of the editor viewport. And in case you don't know what that means, the editor viewport is the little window where you can actually see the game while you're working on it. And when you're moving around in this window to look at your game, you're shifting around the position of the editor viewport. So every frame we check how far the editor viewport is away from the origin. And then we offset all the background layers based on their parallax value. Let me give you a concrete example. 
Let's say a parallax layer is set to move at 25% speed. Now, if we click and move the editor viewport 100 units to the right, the parallax layer will have effectively moved 100 units to the left because everything in the editor stays where it is when the viewport moves around. So it moves 100 units to the right, meaning the parallax layer is 100 units to the left of where it used to be relative to the editor viewport. But we were only supposed to move at 25% speed, which means we only should have moved 25 units. We moved 75 units too far. To fix this and make it parallax properly, all we need to do is offset our parallax layer 75 units back towards the right. So to make it work, we just set up tool scripts on the parallax layers that do that calculation. We can set their parallax value and then it offsets the layer's position based on that parallax value whenever the editor viewport gets moved around. But because the parallaxing is based on the editor viewport position, there's a weird side effect where if you resize the editor window or even just open or close tabs that cause the editor window to move around, then the background layers will parallax. And it looks super wrong. I tried to figure out a solution to this for a long time before I realized that the math is actually correct. It just looks weird. And the solution for it looking weird is the Isadora view. By having Isadora and the camera outline in the scene, these resizing changes feel totally normal. And that's mainly because the Isadora view, Isadora herself, is pinned to the editor viewport's position. When she's not there, you can't tell that the editor viewport position changed. So when you resize the window, the parallaxing looks wrong. It looks like it happened for no reason. But by pinning her to the viewport position, you can see when it changes. And even when you're the one moving the viewport around directly, just having her in the center there with the camera view makes the whole thing easier to understand. And even if my explanation here was a little confusing, you can see the preview of how it works in editor and it feels totally normal. The parallaxing just makes sense. So with that, we have two requirements finished, right? Malif doesn't have to use the messy original project, and we can edit the background layers super easily while previewing them in editor. But this layer system also solves the render tags. On these layer nodes, you can see that it shows which layer it's on, and it also has these buttons to move it forward or backward. And under the hood, the tool script enforces these layers. Anything on layer one will be behind everything on layer two and in front of everything on layer zero. This was trivially easy to set up because I'm basically just brute forcing it by having the layers manage the Z index values of themselves and all their children directly. Then when I export the decoration data from the level editor, I can just convert these Z indices to the appropriate render tags for them to show up on that layer in the original project. And that brings me to exporting, which means we've made it to the fourth and final requirement, support for the room data. Now this was also super easy to do. <laughs> I wrote a script that just goes through the tile map data of a room and saves it out to a JSON file. That file looks like this. It's essentially just a list of all the tiles in the tile map. Then I created a level geometry tile set in the editor project, which just takes that JSON file and populates all the tiles. I created a couple of viewing modes, the standard blue builder tile that I'm using in the level designs in the original project, or a more wireframey one, which is easier to decorate on top of. But essentially, we'll just be able to decorate the level on top of the original geometry of the rooms that I set up in the first project, including new tile sets that just sit on top of the original level geometry. And then when you run the level editor, the level geo hides itself, so you only see the decorations, but it keeps the collision data. So while decorating, you don't actually have to worry about collisions or anything because the level geometry exists hidden underneath the tiles. And speaking of running the level, I didn't actually mention it, but I poured it over the entire player controller from the original project so that when you press play on the level editor, you can actually run around and see how it would look and feel to play through as if this was the original project. And because I poured it over the character controller, it is a one-to-one -one recreation. If this is how it feels to the editor, that's how it will feel in the original project. And that's basically it. Now we have a level editor that meets all of our requirements and I'm really happy with it. Now, admittedly, I didn't fully formalize the process of taking the decoration data out of the level editor and importing it into the original project, but that's because it'll partially depend on how Malif decides to set stuff up in here. So the basics are good to go, but I didn't want to prematurely optimize the export process if I was going to have to change it later. And I also realized that this level building system doesn't actually have a good tool for controlling the camera limits so that we can properly frame the gameplay. And I started to work on that tool, but I realized I should save it for another video. <laughs> and now to thank the patrons and channel members, pop them on screen. Extra special shout out to the GOAT, Talons. <laughs> if you want to be featured in the credits here, or you want to support the development of Isadora's Edge directly, check out my Patreon or my channel memberships. And also check out the Game Jam. Way more people have joined than I expected, so I think it's going to be a really awesome experience. All right, peace out.